four of the key people responsible for the movie you've just seen, so let's bring them out one by one to begin with. And let me just say, all four Oscar nominated. Uh, just Whoa. recently. Choice for Best Film Editor of the Year, and this weekend also of the American Cinema Editors. Please welcome Hank Corwin, film editor. Next up, one of the top producers out there from Plan G Entertainment, please welcome producer Jeremy Kleiner. Next, he is co writer Charles Randolph. script that he was 
considering making that I, I love that was also about politics. So I kind of knew about his, um, I guess I'll call his like real heart and soul as an artist. We got the phone call. Um, how Adam McKay loves the big short and he would like to do a pass on the script and direct it. And I remember thinking, okay, cool, um, yeah. Um, and, I, and I was like having, like saying the words on the phone, but the whole time I was going, you effing idiot, why didn't you think of that earlier? <laughs> it, was so, it was so kind of clear, it, something clicked into our minds that that was, that that was the perfect artistic choice and also that it was, it just, it was gonna activate what was so compelling about the material but that we had not, this is an interesting lesson in, in how the, the business works which is, um, you know, sometimes, because we've been working on this thing for six years and like half the battle is like, staying alive long enough so that the universe, uh, the movie gods can hand you this this kind of incredible present uh, gift that they did. And also just that, that um, you know, we are encouraged to um, think of people as doing like, okay, this director or, you know, does this genre, this director does that genre, and, and that people are capable of so much more than what, you know, um, others might, or what the kind of conventional wisdom is. And, and this is a, story about people who, who buck conventional wisdom, so there's something apt about how Adam McKay ends up being the perfect director for this um, against conventional wisdom. So the film that we see has uh, sort of blended the, the two approaches to the script of Charles and Adam, and, and one of the things that's been uh, so nice and, and refreshing to see is how you know, you, you both have been so complimentary about the things that the other brought to the project and very, uh, you know, very specific about that. So I want to ask you, to begin with Charles, just um, first of all, what is it about Michael Lewis as a, an author that now all three of the books that have been, all three of the movies that have been made from his books have turned into, uh, you know, fascinating movies as well, Best Picture nominated, acting nominations. It's, is there something cinematic about the way he writes? And then also for you, um, when when you took that initial, uh, you know, go at this, what what did you find? You know, what what was what was that experience like for you? Well, uh, Adam and I is famously getting along is utter bullshit uh, <laughs> because I hate him, and we were paid quite a um, bit of money by. Oh, we just knew that for a cameo, you just want to put on a good face. Uh, there was a Maserati in my driveway, <laughs> and it just with a note from uh, Brad Gray saying, Mike, make nicey with Charles. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's rare when you get, you know, because you get rewritten, and of course, you know, you, in, in, you emotionally want to feel like a guy fucked your work up really badly and doesn't, doesn't appreciate your genius. So it's rare to get a script where you realize someone has gone through and address so many of the problems you spent months addressing and done such a beautiful job of solving some of the things that you were never happy with your own solutions. Um, and you know, like all writers, I have this sort of critical voice on my shoulder. Part of the job of writing is writing, part of the job is editing, right? Uh, what you write. And that critical voice is so angry and brutal and <laughs> the way that McKay just slapped that critical voice in his draft down was just, just gorgeous, and so I, I'm happy that he beat up my own, you know, my own, yeah, my own inability, my own ability to criticize what he thought. So I was just so happy when I got his draft because I just he had done so many smart things. We can talk about what those are. Um, Michael Lewis casts his books really well. What Michael does is he's interested in the world, and he goes through and he finds the human beings that have the most interesting story. And I think part of the reason he's very good at that is he takes his characters at their word. He, he, he allows them to you know, articulate what they're after, what they want, so they're inherently cinematic because they have clear wants, but then he sort of lets them hang themselves, or, or not hang themselves, depending on who they are. And so he, he is very gen uniquely generous in not trying to pass judgment on the people he writes about overtly, uh, and that has served him extremely well. Um, and of course, he's a wonderful gift for explaining complicated things. And he's a man of real courage. You know, I, I, mean, I think one of the things we felt, both of us, when we first read the book, is here's someone who embodies a perspective that we agree with, that, we, that resonates with us, who's willing to take on an entire world, an entire industry, and say, eh, no, not really, guys. This is actually what, what's going on, what happened here. 
Uh, and let me try to explain that to you in a way that, that, that uh, is, is accurate and, and, and resonates. So, um, yeah, he's a remarkable guy in that way. Um, and would you add anything about Michael Lewis? And then also, can you talk about, I think, one of the, the big things that you, you brought to the project was this idea of breaking the fourth wall. And why was that, uh, you know, very important to you? Well, you know, I, I, I obviously became a big fan of Michael Lewis's and, and read everything he's done. And I think Charles is spot on when he talks about letting characters tell their own stories. He's got a very journalistic flair in that sense, but he's also a master storyteller. But what I love about Michael Lewis is that he talks about something we don't always talk about uh, as much anymore in America, which is he talks about like the transformational value of ideas. And he loves to find these ideas that are really obscure, that no one paid attention to when they came along. For instance, the passing rules change in football. Uh, suddenly it's a quarterback's game. Oh, what do you know? The blind side has to be protected. The left tackle suddenly is making seven times more money than he used to. Or in the case of baseball, they for some reason refuse to have a salary cap. So these guys have to get really clever, and this small little idea translates to one of the great winning streaks of all time and affects all these people. So that, that was kind of a key to this movie that Charles and I have talked about, was that this little thing, the mortgage-backed security, and these idea of sort of exotic securitizations transform banking in a way that none of us ever saw and how it affected all of us eventually. So I think that's one of his gifts as well, is that he really, just lives in a world of ideas, but he's able to translate them to characters. And uh, and when I read Charles's script, I was like, and Jeremy, Jeremy remembers this, I was just like, this is a good script. Like, there was a lot of great stuff in it. And, I, and that was the most encouraging moment I had. I expected to like, well, it hasn't gone anywhere. And I read the script, and I was like, wait a minute, this is really good. Um, but my initial idea when I read the book was, you know, you always try and let the story tell you what it needs. And I was really surprised that I loved the book as much as I did. And the answer was break the fourth wall, talk to the audience, because we all know the number one rule of film school is show, don't tell. And uh, but it was like, the, it was just screaming to sort of open itself <laughs> up. I mean, the whole movie is, you know, the whole story that Michael Lewis wrote in the movie is about looking behind the curtain at a world that we're all kind of blind to. Um, so fortunately, you know, I had done a lot of that in theater in uh, Chicago in the 90s and seen a lot of movies like 24-Hour Party, people that had done that. And even more fortunately, uh, Jeremy and Dee and Brad Pitt were open to that idea, and so was Paramount, because that could have been where it stopped. Well, I, I want to say, you know, uh, we did like a number of previews of the film in, in theaters like this. And kind of the most heartening thing about it is you know when you when you read the cards and how people respond there was consistently this this thing of how the film was honest the film was direct the film you know didn't bullshit me the film told me the truth or you know let the film was eye opening and i so i think the fourth wall thing you know is usually talked about as like a formal device like you know almost like a technical Thing, like the way you use the camera. But I think what was so so exciting about it is the way Adam used it is it's the it's the heart and soul of the film. It's it's almost like the voice of it's the voice of outrage and it's the voice I I feel also of compassion and and that the film the film is it gives the film a, a personality and a character. So you know I, you know what I mean? I feel like I feel like it's 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 a wonderful way in which the use of a technique also has enormous like emotional power and I um, so I, I just want to say that because I think I feel like that is what's wonderful about the film is that it's you know we live in a world where you know it feels like we're often not being told the truth about things that are of massive importance to our life and Adam found this vehicle to make the film almost like the source of, of a certain kind of truth and a certain kind of uh, direct shot into your veins of something that we don't always get in our daily life. And, and it's also interesting about that journey that solves such a huge problem we always had. Is this, here's a film where are any of these characters really likable because they all get involved in this thing that turns on us. And yet the film 
becomes a character in the film. The voice of the creator, the voice of Brian, that, that it just, it's this lovely way that it becomes the thing we attach ourselves to emotionally. And it's such a genius move. I'm so jealous. <laughs> it's just, it is sheer. Remember, remember the deal that was made about we have to just continue to talk. Yeah, they're gonna take away the line. I love Charles. <laughs> um, so one of the most important things that happened was that um, every person that you wrote the script with in mind, I know, panned out that you got, you ended up with the casting line. But another thing that really um, was essential in the shaping of this film is that you got such a terrific film editor. And so I want to ask uh, how that conversation began, literally, Hank, because I understand it was kind of uh, funny at the beginning, the first, you know, contact that you and Adam had. Um, she told me it was Adam McKay. And you know, I don't do comedy. <laughs> talk to him, you know, and I felt really safe. You know, he gave me the reference of 24 winter bottoms, 24 hour party people. And, you know, it's like just talking to him and meeting him, I got permission to to fail, you know, which is very in our world can be very rare. Uh, and I was able my my job, because I'm I'm not a financial head, but my job was to get this film to try to get this film to resonate on an emotional level and to 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 get into into like this emotional consciousness. And you know, I I, I tried some pretty whack things, very deliberately. You know, I you know philosophically we had different ways of seeing each character grouping. And you know, I, I, I could see myself really getting slapped down by another director. Adam was welcoming. You know, it was, it was a magnificent experience for me because of that. And Hank, can you talk about the fact that I mean, you cut to the personalities, you cut different ways for different characters' personalities, you um, did things where people didn't know they, you know, used footage when they weren't um, necessarily acting. Can you talk about just the thought process behind some of those decisions. Sure, well, again, you know, I didn't write the script. I didn't, I didn't understand the nuances of the finance. So I figured like, I would have to really try to understand each one of the characters and character groupings like on, on an emotional level, you know, and on a, well, on a psychological level. Mike Burry was the guy, I, I first started, the, 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 the job was really daunting because there was so much material. So uh, the Christian Bale character, Mike Burry, was the one I felt uh, the, the, most, uh, the most similar to the way I, 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 I perceived the world, right? You know, and I, I perceived myself in the world, so I started with him. You know, he was he was very internal. He was quiet, uh, and I you know I I built I built for him just a uh, and and a world where where you know he inhabited this you know I've, I've described it, we've talked about it, it's almost like the synapses in your brain you know so so you could you know it's like I'm not being very good about this but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, a process is an interesting thing to talk about, uh, but he, you know, he, 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 his, his film was was very impressionistic. You know, the the editing style for him was very impressionistic, whereas the uh, Steve Carell character, Mark Baum, was 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 just furious and explosive, and I I deliberately spent like at the beginning. Where where he goes to the shrink's office and stuff, I, I you know the cutting the cutting style there is deliberately aggressive and kind of ugly and you know obviously deliberately so, uh, and then the uh, you know the Brad Pitt grouping is cut more traditionally. Uh, what happens you know and for me this was also a way to keep the grouping separated so. Uh, 
I would understand. I, it's not like I'm thinking in terms of you, the audience. You know, I'm, no, so no. I, I've got to understand it first before I start thinking about how other people understand it. Um, so, I, you know, once- it's like, I, I find this to be so brilliant. Like, even this, this simple idea that like, the per that almost like because Hank wasn't inside of the financial terminology, he was able to access it in this completely elemental way. And he's like talking about this like, oh, I had these groupings. It's like such an amazing yeah, way. Yeah, I'm probably dysfunctional everything else in my life. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 I think it's really, it's a really cool way, which, it, which is I think why the film is resonating because it's, you're talking about it like in very, almost like what's underneath everything in you know, this just basic way. You know what was so interesting was when uh, I first came into the edit room, Hank was like, first off, Hank constantly makes me laugh. But, uh, and he's brilliant, obviously. But I came to the edit room and he was like, wanted to show me the first scene you cut, the Michael Burry scene. And he's like, ah, you're gonna fire me. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing like getting fired. I understand what it's like. Ah, uh, I really made some choices here. <laughs> really. Ah. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, Hank, and, and Robin Woolley, our co-producer, remembers she was with me. And I was like, Hank, just show it to us. Like, you can't do any wrong. Like, we're, my approach to the movie was always that we have to bring the powers of filmmaking to bear. Like, all the things we've learned out here in Los Angeles and in filmmaking worldwide, we have to bring to bear on this subject because it has been hammered into the American people that it is dry, that it is boring, and it doesn't concern us, when it obviously is rich, exciting, and definitely concerns us. So he shows me this scene with Michael Burry, with Christian Bale, and the football flashback, and the glass eye, and I was so excited. I was like, this is the reason we hired Hank, he's an artist, and Robin remembers, he, he would show us scenes and we would skip out of the edit room. I was just like, oh my God, we found our guy. And I would give a couple notes, and then obviously once I love that you leave for a week. <laughs> <laughs> and later Hank told me, he's like, you know, you were so happy with everything I was doing, I almost lost respect for you. <laughs> And then my, my other favorite hack admission is the very end of the movie. We go through this entire journey together, and it's incredible. I mean, we're collaborating on like you know this great level, and our composer and everyone like is just it's one of these magical experiences where we all are looking at the same thing we're headed towards. And I told them I said they worked overtime to get this movie done, so we go and we do like a big celebration. And at the very end of it, Hank goes, "I have something to tell you." And he really looks like he like tried to fondle my wife or something when he's talking. About. I'm like, Jesus, Hank, what? What happened? Do you have a criminal record? Or he goes, you know, I've never seen any of your movies you've done. I'm like, Hank, I don't care. You if you had seen Step Brothers 30 times, although I love that movie. Um, and he really was guilty and really felt bad. I'm like, hey, I don't care. I just felt like I should have told you that. <laughs> anyway, this is such a great testimony to, to Adam's collaborative spirit, right? Every single person who showed up on the set or any part of the process came not just to do their job, but to play, right? And it, it, there, there are numerous examples many you've read in the press. My favorite is the way that Adam took the notes of Gosling's character. So, that, so, the, so the man that Gosling is basically portraying calls up Adam up and says, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't act that way. I got fashion friends. You know? And Adam's like, all right. You, you just tell us whatever you don't like, and we're going to have Gosling turn to the camera and say those words. And, sure. and what happens is Gosling's character is so interesting, because here's a guy who's complaining about his portrayal in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> he portrayed it. Right? Like, you know, 
and Michael Lewis described it as he's this like an unreliable narrator who suddenly starts telling the truth on you, you know? And it's just it's such an interesting, complicated relationship for the narrator to be in relation to the audience. It's just utterly fantastic. It comes from Mr. Adam McKay just taking another note. I'm gonna I'm gonna integrate this into the whole project. I couldn't believe it, the real guy. I said I said, Greg, you tell me whatever you don't like, and I'll have Ryan say it right to camera. And he was like, Wait, what? And he goes, he's a traitor. I mean, he's from Bluchin Act. Like, he's a really successful, very smart guy. And you, there was this long pause where he was like, what's the angle here? And I was like, there's no angle. Like, whatever you don't like or don't think is true, I will have Ryan say to Cameron. We did. And Gossel loved it, of course. <laughs> and came back and it's like, he doesn't like this. He doesn't like this. Like, say it to Cameron. And uh, the best moment is he's like, I never would. I never would have been in one of those clubs. I had fashion friends. <laughs> and he comes back and he goes, he told me this. I go, we're saying it to camera. Again. So great. Last question I just want to pose to anyone who cares to jump in is, you know, obviously there's a lot of fun moments in the movie like those we've talked about. Obviously also some, some very weighty uh, things and, and you leave the movie thinking a lot about what you've seen. What is it if you guys could kind of... Uh, have it your way, what would people leave here um, both, you know, what would you like them to take away from this experience and, and is there something that they could do in the real world that you would hope would be a little helpful? We'll let everyone give an answer to this because it's a, a big question, but my big thing with this is we've now traveled around with this movie. We've been to Washington, D.C. We've met with you know, Obama's economic team, we've met with Elizabeth Warren, we've met with the press, we've been in New York, there's been arguments between financial journalists, we've had Krugman going at it with the Murdoch press, we've, <laughs> you know, seen regular people responding with anger to this, and we've seen a lot, of, and it's really exciting, and we've actually seen the movie show up in a presidential campaign, you know, with Bernie Sanders talking about it, and the debate between him and Hillary Clinton, I would love for it to show up a little bit more on the right wing, but the movie's you know only half done with its play now. We'll see. But to me, the big thing is is really really simple. And Bill Moyers just wrote a great piece about this, uh, about what he wishes Obama would say in his last speech. And it's just strictly about money and politics. And these banks own Washington D.C. They have 95% of D.C. in their pocket. And when you're there, you can feel it. And I would just say that whoever you're gonna vote for, whether they're Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, whatever they are, just check where they're taking their money from. And if they're taking their money from banks, do not vote for them. Because that money is not being paid for no reason. They actually did a study on lobbying money. The return on lobbying money is a thousand to one for these companies. And trust me, they are not dumb enough to pay this money out. Don't vote for them. Even if you really like them, even if you think, like, I will never again vote for a candidate who takes one dime from big banks, oil companies, or we're a billionaire. So that's, that's my take it home. Okay. <laughs> you know, every time I ask this question, I get a different answer, but I think the one I, I would give today is um, <clears throat> that obfuscation in jargon Right, is something that often hides behind it a, an agenda. And if we could do a little bit, right, to help people see that, you know, that when, when, when someone is acting as though something's too complicated for you to understand, <laughs> they usually have a reason for that, yeah, right, yeah. in their own self interest. So, so if we could just get people to, to do a little bit, you know, I'm going to be a little bit patient and endure a little bit of complexity just to look behind the curtain, and then I'm, then I'm happy. Yeah, I, I think for what I would say is kind of a variant of what Adam and Charles said. I mean, um, I, I think the, the financial crisis of 2008, which was years in the making, um, you know, has not been under, has not been maybe recognized as the seismic event that it is that we're still living in. And it's an event in which, you know, the the income inequality that is um, so obscene in our society, you know, 
was was made worse, and the and the, the same trends that are underneath that income inequality, um, that prior to 2008 um, there were contributors to the crisis, um, uh, are present today, and um, they, it threatens the very innate fabric of our society, and uh, and uh, there's a lot of human suffering, and. Um, and the, the human costs of that crisis are absolutely enormous. And um, I think that, uh, I think a consciousness of that, um, I don't, you know, as to for what to do about it, I, Adam uh, mentioned something specific, and I think Charles is talking about becoming more involved in your own financial life, because this jargon is meant to exclude you, and you don't have to be excluded from it. But I think, um, I think I I think I don't know what the action plan for it is, but I think that a consciousness of of um, how unfair our society has become is a, is a, is something to really register, and that might drive a hundred different people to a hundred different forms of action. But it is a it is a pretty daunting and uh, overwhelming fact of our of our time. Yeah, it's just uh, it's pretty great to work on a movie that's more than just a movie. Uh, it's a uh, it's the beginning of the discussion. I think if, if people if people open their eyes and they just they talk about this and they uh, they just participate in, 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 in this new kind of thinking, I think we we go fantastic as well. Thank you all. Please, Hank, uh, you got to check out Anchorman, and thank you all for. <laughs>